Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week on the show, we're featuring an interview with three activists involved in the Emergency Committee for Rojava about recent developments in Rojava, escalating violence from the Turkish state and the KDP party-led Kurdish regional government in Iraq, experiences of recent visits, updates on the U.S. relationship to aggressive regimes in the region, as well as the Kurdish Autonomous Administration and other topics. If you check the show notes, you'll find links to further reading and organizations to check out on the subject, as well as links to past shows what we've done about Rojava. A couple of quick announcements. If you didn't hear, we released a podcast in the middle of last week with anarchists involved in the anti-repression in France concerning the conspiracy case known as the December 8th Affair, December 8th case, where the French state surveilled and arrested a YPG veteran who goes by the name Libre Flo, as well as comrades and acquaintances on the accusation of building a terror network following the Movement for Black Lives uprisings against police in 2020 in France. You can find that show in our podcast feed or wherever you can find episodes. If you're looking for ways to support folks in or from Palestine during the unprecedented genocidal violence of the Israeli settler state, one nonprofit that we've heard is a good place for distributing funds to people in need is the Hebron International Network. You can find that at nonviolenceinternational.net slash donate underscore H-I-R-N. Surely, there are more out there, but be careful to vet where you send money due to the precedent set by the U.S. government of pursuing charges against nonprofits funding people in Palestine by claiming that they're supporting terrorists, even when they aren't, uh, as in the case of the Holy Land Five. Uh, anarchist prisoner Michael Kimball is fundraising right now to help cover legal costs as he attempts to gain freedom from prison after decades behind bars. You can find more info on his website anarchylive.noblogs.org or make donations via the link fundly f-u-n-d-l-y dot com slash help hyphen michael hyphen kimball hyphen hire hyphen a hyphen new hyphen attorney anya here um, i pronounce she her i'm originally from ukraine but i'm currently living on the unceded lands of the onondaga nation upstate new york uh, I'm Clara. Um, she, her is good for me. I'm in New York City, so the Lenape territory. Um, yeah. And Arthur here, he, his, and uh, I'm in Seattle, so Coast Salish territory, broadly speaking. Cool. Thank you very much. And thanks for being willing to speak to me. Uh, we're going to be speaking here about the updated situation in the Autonomous Administration of Northeast Syria, uh, a.k.a. Rojava. Could y'all speak a bit about your experience with the region? What is the Emergency Committee for Rojava and uh, what brought you to that project? Okay, I can start us off, I guess. Thanks so much for having us on this show. And uh, I learned about Rojava in 2017. That was the height of the fight against ISIS. Sort of got fascinated by the ambition and the scope of this project. They're trying to revolutionize revolutionize um, every aspect of social life and they're doing it on a territory that is now populated by at least 4 million people so that's quite impressive and um, at that time I was not really able to go to the region but I decided to go to Bakur, North Kurdistan occupied by Turkey just to see what the Kurdish movement was able to achieve there because the really the first attempt to build this a uh, new social political system based on the ideology of um, democratic confederalism was attempted there. Unfortunately, it was brutally crushed by the Turkish government. So when I was there in 2018, two years after the military operation by the Turkish state against uh, the movement in the Kurdish majority regions, uh, people were quite demoralized and the Popular assemblies, cooperatives, autonomous municipalities were basically wiped out. They were not functioning anymore. And so that just, I guess, got me thinking that we should be doing a better job internationally to make sure that um, the same would not happen 
in uh, northeast Syria. And so I joined the Emergency Committee for Rojava, which started out in New York City in 2018. I joined it soon after it was co-founded by Debbie Bookchin and some other folks and uh, have been involved with ECR since then. And uh, just kind of very quick preview of what ECR is. It's a US-based national organization that does work in solidarity with the Kurdish freedom movement more broadly, but particularly with Northeast Syria. And if anyone from New York is listening, um, we try to do most of our monthly meetings in a hybrid format. So we meet in person in New York City and uh, folks from other parts of the country call in via Zoom. And um, you know, we believe that because we are based in the United States, we have, um, it's you know, especially important for us to defend this project uh, just because of the United States' very long history of destabilization in this region in the Middle East, but more particularly because of the U.S. long history of support for and complicity, direct complicity in Turkey's war on Kurds that continues until today. So we just recognize the, the need to engage uh, in politics, engage in solidarity effort here in the United States, sort of on two levels, um, if I may use a Zapatista metaphor, um, from above and from below. So in terms of politics from above, we try to put pressure on the United States government, demanding that it end its complicity with the, the Turkish state, uh, that it stop uh, military uh, sales, um, you know, financial aid, uh, for any uh, mi military um, equipment uh, that it uh, forces Turkey into resuming peace negotiations with the Kurdish freedom movement um, to ensure sort of long lasting peace in the region. But we also try to do politics from below by reaching out and building bridges with um, different leftist and progressive groups across the United States uh, who engage in similar type of politics and similar type of struggles that the people in Northeast Syria in the Kurdish freedom movement does. That's all on my part. Thanks a lot. I wonder if we should just keep the kind of, I don't know, the sequence that we started with the intros. Does that make sense, Clara? Yeah, fine. Okay, right. I am uh, Clara Moore. I think Anya gave a really great uh, overview of the, the ECR <clears throat> and the work here. So I was living in Rojava for two years, um, working at the Rojava Information Center and then also with the, the women's movement, um, genealogy academies and the, the Malajin, the restorative justice uh, system. So Malajin is a Kurdish phrase that means a women's house. And it applies a restorative justice model towards domestic and family issues. So yeah, hopefully we talk some about that. I will pass it over to Arthur. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so Arthur again here. I uh, I think my interest in the Rojava Revolution and the Kurdish Freedom Movement more broadly goes back to um, the Siege of Kobani, 2014-2015, uh, and just being kind of like a, an activist, you could say, um, hearing from a lot of other people kind of this strange buzz that there's this revolution happening across the world and it's like the Spanish revolution all over again. And, you know, at first it all sounded kind of like romanticized and I felt very skeptical and it was all too good to be true, but I looked into it and, and really quickly became like fascinated and inspired by what was going on there. The idea of democratic confederalism and this like bottom up grassroots democracy as an alternative to the state alternatives to capitalism and patriarchy also being experimented with. And I think that really started me on a journey to trying to learn more and more. As I learned more and more, I also wanted to get uh, more and more involved in trying to support in some way, meeting people who went there was really influential. Also getting connected with uh, activists that were doing solidarity work was very influential. But eventually I wanted to travel there. I wanted to see it for myself, I had this strong sense that movements here in the US and the West broadly, everywhere in the world really just had so much to learn from the revolution in Rojava and not only from their accomplishments, but also like because it's a real 
life social revolution that's happening in real time. Also felt that there's a lot to be learned from like the challenges that they're facing too and what they're doing to kind of like navigate those challenges. So eventually I, I decided to go there. It took many years to kind of for that to make sense, but I recently returned from spending one year there roughly. And in my time there, I was mainly doing research and spending time with various structures of the movement. I'm sure we'll get into like details later, but was was lucky to spend time um, in things like communes and cooperatives and meeting people from all kinds of different aspects of the movement, autonomous women's structures, and really was incredibly inspired by, by what I saw there. So when it comes to ECR, Emergency Committee for Rojava, that is, I think that's kind of what comes to mind is something that our, our late comrade uh, in ECR, Meredith Tax, once said, which I'm paraphrasing, but she said something like, if we want to learn from this experiment, we have to help defend it or we have to help it survive. And I, and I think that really says it all, no? That like, it's, it's not some academic abstract project that we, we want to like learn about this revolution from the outside and sort of extract our knowledge and our strategies from it, that we really feel responsibility to be in solidarity with it in an active way. And that's what the Emergency Committee for Rojava is all about. Like Anya said, we do a lot of different kinds of act advocacy, but we're trying to basically teach people what's going on in the movement and try to build like a grassroots solidarity movement here in the U.S. So I had a chance recently to speak with Hazel and Katya, uh, who'd recently come back from Bakur across the border in Turkish Kurdistan, where much of the ideological and infrastructural roots of the Rojava revolution sprouted from. And since we've covered some of the history in the past of the Rojava revolution um, in prior episodes, including one that Anya was on, I'd suggest that listeners needing a refresher, check out one of our back episodes, uh, including ones that are transcribed, if that's easier for you, or the website for the um, Emergency Committee for Rojava. It's an enormous topic. <laughs> I know. Uh, to be frank, like any of the subject matters that y'all had said, like, I'm prepared to talk about this. That is, I mean, that's uh, half a book right there. Yep. <laughs> I wonder if uh, from having been in in Kurdistan generally, whether like whichever side of the border with Turkey you were on, from talking with regular people, if you got a sense of dynamics between people there who were eager to participate in the political project of the Rojava social revolution versus those who are just going about their day-to-day -day lives. Because there's like, anytime you're in a territorial, anytime you're in an area, whether it be uh, one of the attempted autonomous zones that occurred, you know, in the so-called USA during the uprisings of 2020, or like any, any like Zapatista struggle, you'll have people that are just they just they're like, this is my home. I'm just here versus the people that are real advocates for a specific vision. Um, but I, I, yeah, I wonder if, if you have any sort of like examples that you could talk about of, or reflections on the contrast between those or how people were able to navigate that. And also how, if this might be another question, but how the autonomous administration interacts with non-movement people in Rojava. I think this is a really great question, and I'm really, I'm really glad you asked it, right? Because it's, it's a region of 4 million people, and that's something that's really important to understand, is that people have different political histories, um, there are even different Kurdish movements in the region, and there's many different ethnic groups that have their own um, histories, and the point of the autonomous administration is to bring everybody together with certain principles that are red line. So those being gender equality, direct participation, um, pluralism, and self-defense. So of the different uh, ethnic groups. And so there's essentially what the autonomous administration tries to do is create a framework with red lines for people of all different political persuasions, all different backgrounds to participate in a project together, create harmony in the society. Now, there are plenty of people, therefore, who weren't necessarily aligned exactly with the, um, when we say the movement, often what we're talking about is the, the Kurdish freedom movement and sort of the PKK and that revolutionary history can be, although it can be, it's evolving, constantly changing, you know, what, what the movement means as more people take ownership over the project and how it's evolving on the ground. And so the autonomous administration 
actually includes, um, while it was, it came out of that history and it was established by the movement, so to speak, nowadays on the ground, there's people with all different political ideas, um, backgrounds who are participating in and helping to build up the project, which is, which is the idea <laughs> that the movement um, to establish. And so there are plenty of people who work within the autonomous administration who aren't necessarily directly aligned with the quote unquote movement, so to speak, but appreciate and acknowledge the the structure that the autonomous administration allows for people to pursue democratic self-determination in the region. And then, of course, there are people who just don't support the autonomous administration at all, right? There are people who support the Syrian regime who live in the area. Um, there are people who might support um, the Iraqi Kurdistan, their model of sort of capitalist Kurdish nationalism uh, as what they would want um, for, for, for Northeast Syria. So there are people of all different um, types of political persuasions. There are plenty of people also who are just not interested in being politically involved. I mean, I think that's an interesting access also when we talk about social revolution and social projects and direct democracy. There's also an individual temperament element, right? Um, it takes it takes energy um, and focus and, and interest um, on a certain level to be consistently politically involved. Um, and so there are plenty of people who just are also not trying to focus their energy necessarily on this project, but maybe appreciate it or don't. It's also a very difficult situation it's in general. They were under embargo. They really still are in many ways. Uh, the U.S. was a big player in that until recently, until last summer. They're under bombs. <laughs> Daesh is an insurgency. Um, so it's a really difficult situation. There's not enough uh, electricity. There's less electricity than there was before the war under the Syrian regime in the region. The economic situation in the autonomous administration regions is the best in Syria. But it's, that's not saying much. <laughs> this is a country that has experienced 12 years of war. So you're also getting internally displaced people from other parts of Syria who are coming to the autonomous administration because the economic situation is better there. And so you're getting sort of a flood of, of, of migrants as well, um, which puts stress on the system. And so there, it's a really difficult situation. And the autonomous administration are the people who get you know, the people turn to and say, "Hey, what's going on? You know, why is why is why is oil so expensive now? Why you know is all are all, all of these things happening?" And so they're now the people sort of quote unquote in power, and that's that that idea is antithetical to the autonomous administration. The idea is that you're working together as a community. But again, if you know, most people are very in the world even <laughs> um, are very used to the idea of relating to the governance structure in your region as you know, somebody above you or somebody to, to sort of fight with, maybe, so to speak, right? Or to be in opposition to or something like this, right? And so you have the idea of the autonomous administration is to bring everybody into the project so people take responsibility for fixing things. That's obviously, a it takes education, it takes, you know, reality on the ground, even the people in the autonomous administration, they're also learning like what that means, right? And so you have, you have all these dynamics of what's going on in, in the region and like trying to build a genuinely new way of relating to governance amongst the population in the context of war. But yeah, some people don't like the autonomous administration. Some people do. Um, some people work in it and don't like it. <laughs> some people, because it's also uh, a lot of jobs it provides at this point. And so, yeah, this is a complicated thing. I hope that uh, <laughs> helps to understand how, how complicated it is. <laughs> Yeah, I would just, I think it's such a great question. I would just quickly add a couple of things, you know, because this is maybe like the topic I thought about the most in my time there, right? This like uneven development of these bottom up structures of governance, because it's like, it's one thing to push out the forces of the state and create a revolutionary new structure of local self governance, but it's a whole nother thing to get people to show up to it, right? to buy into it, to take a sense of ownership and responsibility, to take a sense of, of basically like an, to play an active role. And the, what makes people participate or not participate in some ways is reflective of just the kind of general divisions in society that existed before the revolution. So sometimes these things manifest in along like cultural lines or different lines of identity. Sometimes these things line up with like levels of education, line up with, you know, gender dynamics, um, all kinds of different things are, are going on in, in these structures that determine kind of who participates more and less and how. 
but even I want to say even within the kind of community of people that would consider themselves a part of the the movement, so to speak, a lot of people say they're supporters of the revolution, but they don't actively participate in like the communes, for example. And they still have this kind of very passive approach to it and treat the administration as like a, a government that they support, but still a passive approach. Like people who are in the movement more in a more committed sense call this like a state mentality. And I've, I've heard some of the more committed people complain, like literally talking about their fellow Kurds saying like, it's easier to get these people to pick up a gun and go to war and die than to attend an assembly. It's like the hardest thing to do is get somebody to show up to a meeting. So it's really interesting how these things play out. I think it's like one of the most important conversations about the revolution itself. Yes, thank you very much for saying that, Arthur. I'll just say one quick add on to that, which is that David Graeber has a very good intro um, that he wrote into Abdul Ajlan's first prison writing, which is a whole thing. I encourage listeners to look up Abdul Ajlan if they're not familiar. It really helps give context to the revolution in Rojava in general. And one thing that David Graeber said in this intro was, this is a great idea. It's really worth a try. It's worth our support. I think they might have a problem with how much time it takes. And that's something that we just have to contend with, with direct democracy. It takes a lot of time. So something to think about. Yeah, those are all really good points. And I, I appreciate that, the thoughtfulness of it. With that in mind, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what you personally experienced when you were in Rojava. Um, you've, you've already said a little bit about roughly how long you were there and some of the structures that you participated in or were around, but if you could expand on that a little bit, that'd be really great. I can go first here. So I went there twice. My first time was last summer and I just recently returned from my second trip less than two months ago and spent there roughly six months in total. And um, the first time I went to volunteer um, as an English teacher at the University of Rojava, one of the new autonomous universities that the administration has built. There are three of them now. And um, this time uh, I spent some time with the women's house, Malajin, uh, the same Malajin as uh, Clara volunteered uh, with in Kamishlu. And um, perhaps uh, kind of my biggest takeaway, and this is something, um, you know, as an add-on to what Arthur and Clara were talking about for the previous question, I just saw a lot of, a big amount of demoralization among the regular folks. And I believe we need to, when we talk about demoralization and lack of participation, yes, of course, there are internal uh, factors uh, is just the you know what you should expect with any revolution to happen that you won't see you know huge enthusiasm um, among a political people right for a new system of governments necessarily but I think it also has been systematic uh, technique used by the Turkish state to undermine the autonomous administration to make life unlivable in northeast Syria without even having to invade it and occupy it once again, right? So I think probably most of the people listening know Turkey has invaded twice since the second invasion and occupation in 2019 and has been bombarding the region, um, the areas near the front lines, practically on a daily level. Uh, they have been carried out um, drone assassinations of civilian and political leaders of the autonomous administration, just basically creating this atmosphere of fear. But perhaps even more um, significantly, you know, and, and what has had, in my opinion, an even greater impact on people's enthusiasm, right, for this new project, people's willingness to defend or, or build what. Um, is being built there has been uh, the worsening, uh, the ever worsening economic conditions uh, that uh, these people have to live under. And um, one big factor, I mean, of course, we have the depreciation of the Syrian pound, we have the inflation, something that, you know, the autonomous administration cannot control. But there's been also a policy by the Turkish state of, and the Syrian government as well, by, of uh, placing the region under a de facto embargo, 
and the Turkish state has been doing it through its proxy uh, in the KRG, the Kurdistan Regional Government, the KDP, right, the Barzani-led um, uh, party there, um, and they control the only currently functioning border crossing between Northeast Syria and the outside world. Of course, the border with Turkey is pretty much closed. And this was the this is the KRG and um, KDP in Iraq specifically, right? Right in uh, the part of Kurdistan that's within the Iraqi borders. And so the KDP, you know, which has been collaborating with Turkey, including on um, trying to uh, wipe out this uh, uh, revolutionary project that's also been led, you know. By, by Kurds, by their fellow Kurds, they have had control over what can come in and out to the region. So a lot of uh, even basic necessities, uh, the autonomous administration has had trouble to getting them into the region because they have to deal with the KDP that controls the border crossing. Um, or whatever they are able to import uh, has to be imported at, um, you know, uh, higher prices that they would be able to do otherwise. So this fact that the people have to deal, have to struggle to meet their basic needs on a daily basis. I think Clara mentioned like the electricity situation is, of course, even worse now after Turkey's uh, latest military operation on the region. But uh, just uh, the ele just getting electricity, just getting a couple of hours electricity uh, per day is a real struggle and um, from my interactions with regular people i just see that it really weighs down on them um disencouraging them from investing the energy into this project especially when it's so hard to see any hope uh for the any you know sort of uh, resolution on, on terms beneficial to them uh, in in some near future, and um, and I think Turkey has been quite successful in this strategy of demoralizing local population, and by this through this um, basically weakening the popular support and the popular legitimacy of the autonomous administration. Just as a quick follow up to that, if you don't mind. Yeah. So this is, again, after the large earthquake that happened about a year ago that affected the whole region. And I know that like there's a disaffection growing, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, in a bit, hopefully. But throughout Syria, there's a continued like the civil war has never stopped. And there are increasing protest movements against the administration there, as well as uh, there seems to be some it's arguable, I guess, like continued dissatisfaction within Turkey with the Erdogan regime? Is it just like, it's not like people are being disaffected or, or like demoralized uh, with the Rojava project and looking towards the other options as a, as a, a reasonable like alternative, is it? Or is it just like, this is hard work that we're doing and we're still like every day we have less and less water and electricity and tobacco and stuff like that. Oh, it, yeah, no, no, uh, that wasn't my experience. And Anya, you can also jump in. People people want to go to Europe. Yeah, so, and I think Clara mentioned, but the economic situation in Northeast Syria is the best across the entire country. So people actually from other, from the other parts of Syria have been migrating to, to what we call Rojava. Um, so it's not that uh, the Syrian government is representing a viable alternative that people are looking to in the region. It's more just lack of hope, period. So the Rojava Information Center, if people are interested in Rojava and haven't heard of it, is a really great resource. It's a collective of media activists essentially just creating uh, information about the revolution and the structures of the autonomous administration and the situation on the ground, um, the continued ISIS insurgency, um, the occupations of the different parts of um, northern Syria by Turkey, um, human rights violations there. So really just serving as a, as a resource to understand what's going on in the ground because there aren't very many journalists who are based there who are international. Very, I would go so far as to say maybe none. <laughs> um, and so it serves a, a resource and it also helps journalists who want to come to the region and want to cover what's going on uh, in Rojava and northeast Syria to have access to um, 
the people that you need to know on the ground, um, getting into the region can be difficult. So we're also a support system for journalists who want to come. And, um, and also journalists who are writing from abroad who might have a few questions, um, we help fact find um, and serve as a resource um, just to help get the word out, right? Because you can't, can't be in solidarity with something if you, you don't know what's going on. And then I also was with the, the women's movement, um, spent some time uh, with the genealogy academy. So genealogy is a, means um, Kurdish word for woman is jen. And uh, so genealogy means sort of like women's studies, we can say. Um, and so a big part of the, the movement project and the, the women's movement is sort of rewriting the, the script in, in people's heads about how we got to, to where we are. Um, now uh, in the world and in the Middle East in, in terms of the patriarchal structures that exist on the ground um, and just thinking about history and how we got here and so therefore how we're going to get out of it um, and reclaiming mm, women's history for themselves and also for the society in general. So thinking about the beginning of the state in Mesopotamia um, and how the ziggurats, for example, um, institutionalized certain hierarchies within society and we're just retracing that history and so we can rewrite a new future. And doing that work in the context of, of, uh, of the revolution and so women have the opportunity often to go to a genealogy academy and men as well um, to think about these things, think about uh, female personality, the male personality um, and, and how, to, how to move forward move forward together in a good way. And then I also um, was at the university for some time teaching English. Um, and then I also uh, spent several months at the, the Malajin, which again means women's house within the um, justice system in Kamishlo. And that is a place of the justice system in general in Rojava is based on a restorative justice model for most things. So in general, the idea is before you go to court, because there are courts, there are laws, and there are prisons in Rojava, but um, the system is built so that for most things, before you go to court, there is some sort of structure that will help you go through a reconciliation process first. Um, so that is different for different structures. So uh, if you're if you have a trade dispute, you might go to the trade reconciliation office or. Um, if you have a, a, a consumer dispute, you might go to the consumer's support office. For domestic and family issues, um, there's the Malajan, which again is a phrase that means women's house. And so essentially families, um, women, men also seek support from the women's house who are having domestic or family issues of, of one sort or another, um, can come to the women's house, go through a reconciliation process with the women who work there, um, who try to be impartial and yet um, move things obviously towards gender equality in the way that um, things are decided and go through that process and then come to an agreement that then the Malajin itself and then also the Asai Shin, so the women's police, will, will follow up with the families and make sure that the agreements are being adhered to. So, so as I mentioned earlier, I spent a lot of time with a lot of different structures of the movement moving around a lot, traveling to different parts of Rojava, doing interviews and research. But for the sake of time, I think I'll just give one highlight. Um, and that was the time that I spent in a place called Sheba Canton. Um, and for those who don't know, Sheba Canton is like the furthest west uh, region in Rojava or part of Syria that's, that's currently under the purview of the autonomous administration. It's north of Aleppo, kind of in the countryside. It's a very small, isolated pocket. <clears throat> what it is, is it's the place where uh, the people of Efrin were displaced to and kind of like moved their homes. So for those who don't know, the what used to be the furthest northwest pocket of Rojava and also the stronghold of the revolution in just about every way um, was the region of Efrin. But in 2018, uh, Turkey invaded, has occupied since, along with its proxies. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people were displaced. It was a mass act of ethnic cleansing where the, the demographics went from 90-some percent Kurdish to 20-something no, percent, I think, if even that. 
Um, so this was like a devastating blow to the revolution, but many of these families moved to the northern countryside of Aleppo and they basically brought the revolution with them. And the circumstances under which they've been living since 2018 have been very difficult. Many people leave, live in uh, what we would call refugee camps. Um, there's also a bunch of small villages that were largely abandoned at the time, uh, that they arrived, that they have since kind of built up. This part of Syria also includes the city of Tel Rufat. And it's just this incredible place because many of the problems that we're talking about earlier, dynamics of a kind of real struggle that families are having a sense of hopelessness struggles that the movement is having with getting people to support and participate in, take responsibility for the kind of structures of community self-governance, right? The communes, the councils, uh, the economic forms like the cooperatives. In Sheba Canton, things are just different. There's an incredibly high level of cohesion uh, within the community a high level of solidarity, a high level of political consciousness and development, which has like a long history to it. Now, like I say, Afrin was the stronghold of the Rojava revolution, but it's actually much older than that because the Kurdish freedom movement has been active there for basically decades. Um, but what it really showed in a way that I was really grateful for was kind of what these structures can how they can function more at their best when people really are showing up to the assemblies, really are showing up to the communes day in, day out and participating. Um, and it was very inspiring. And, and I think um, it was important to see things working closer to like at their best because it showed a sense of possibilities and also kind of highlighted um, these larger dynamics of the challenges, right? Of Okay, then you have to ask yourself, what, what is it that makes things kind of work different here in Sheba? than elsewhere, um, say in uh, Jazeera, Canton. So I'll stop it there, but that was the highlight of my trip for sure. Thank you, those are those are all really interesting examples that I'd love to learn more of if we have um, some more time near the end of the interview. To speak about some, some of the ongoing pressures and, and recent experiences of folks that are living in that area, currently Rojava, or people there are suffering from continued, as has been pointed to, when naming dates of 2019, 2018, 2016, these escalated cross-border attacks by the Turkish state. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about these Turkish attacks and who's being targeted by them. Democracy Now! recently had a brief headline discussing the escalation and pointing to what I could find reference to in AP or Reuters, maybe just really briefly, of there was an attack on a police station in Ankara, in Turkey's capital. Uh, so they were attributing it to someone that was PKK aligned. I didn't see any. There was it was like two sentences. There was no actual verification of that. But anyway, it kind of skips out of the time scale of this seems to be some sort of increasing, increasing attack by the Turkish state across the border. Um, but yeah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, A, that argument that this is in response to this thing that just occurred a couple of weeks ago that attacked police, or just talk about who is suffering the impacts of these drone or other attacks um, into the autonomous administration territories. So it's a big topic. There absolutely was an attack in Ankara against, uh, looks like, police station outside of the interior ministry. Um, and the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, they they claimed responsibility for that. Um, so that appears to be true. Um, I think two police officers were wounded. Um, Turkey has said that this is some sort of justification for um, its massive bombing campaign against northeast Syria. They've claimed without presenting any evidence whatsoever that these attackers came from Northeast Syria, that there's a direct connection. There's no evidence of that. <clears throat> and regardless, it's, it's, of course, it's no justification. So what's, what's going on in Northeast Syria right now? Starting earlier <clears throat> this week or over the weekend, Turkey started basically systematically bombing the civilian infrastructure of Northeast Syria. They bombed energy stations, oil wells, electrical facilities, factories, 
water facilities, food facilities, hospitals, literally hospitals. Um, the only facility in the region that produces cooking and heating gas has been destroyed. It's going to take $50 million to rebuild that, I believe, according to Rojava Information Center. Um, the impacts of these attacks are like really hard to overstate. Um, the, the region is being terrorized. Erdogan's goal is clearly, as Anya mentioned earlier in, in um, the podcast here, is, is to make Rojava unlivable for the people. So, yeah, they mentioned this, this PKK attack in Ankara as their justification. Of course, it's no justification. Uh, if that attack hadn't happened, I'm sure they would use some other excuse. But, um, again, the impacts are really hard to overstate. The whole region is on, in a state of alert. You know, all, all three of us here, I think I can say, we all have friends there right now who we're talking to every day. People are very, very concerned. Um, civilians have been killed. There's been widespread disruption of basic services. The last I heard, two, at least 2 million people were out of electricity. The winter months are coming. I mean, this could really be catastrophic. And, and I think it, it lays bare the, the real goals of Turkey, no? is, is to actually basically to undermine the revolution, to destroy the revolution by simply making the region unlivable, by terrorizing society itself. These are not military targets, you know. A grain silo is not a military target. A COVID-19 hospital is not a military target. And of course, bombing a military target in Northeast Syria is also not justified. It's a violation of the ceasefire, which has so far been honored by the Syrian Democratic Forces. So I'm sure Anya has, has things to add here, but we at, at ECR, Emergency Committee for Rojava, we're really trying to raise awareness about this issue and, and build some political pressure in, in the U.S., but it's, uh, it's a work in progress. Yeah, I would just also echo that, that Turkey does not need any pretext whatsoever to launch another attack, another operation, another invasion of the region. But it has been, you know, using its anti-terror discourse to justify whatever um, attacks it has been carried out. And the fact that the PKK is on the terror list of... Um, countries like the United States or the European Union has made it very convenient for the international community to remain silent when Turkey uses this discourse um, to justify it, its attacks. And so we were not surprised. We were, of course, very frustrated, but not surprised to see the mainstream media and even such progressive media like Democracy Now! basically repeating Turkish talking points, right? Oh, there was a, an Ankara suicide bomb attack and we are retaliating against so-called terrorists and all the uh, media outlets just repeating that without um, either questioning, like Arthur said, whether Northeast Syria has any connection to that attack, which it does not, or even reporting on which targets uh, Turkey has been bombarding in northeast Syria, clearly not any military targets, but civilian infrastructure. And so that's why we at ECR have been uh, pushing for the resumption and the movement itself has been pushing for the resumption of peace negotiations within Turkey, between the Turkish government and the PKK and the PKK affiliated Kurdish freedom movement to come up with a long uh, term solution to the situation to take away this pretext that the Turkish government has been used using, to, you know, both to crack down on Kurds within its own borders and outside its borders in Syria and Iraq, to remove that, uh, you know, their ability to to use this anti-terror discourse um, as a legitimization tool. And of course, uh, to get to that point, we also need to delist the PKK from other countries' terror lists. And um, it's a good moment to mention the Kurdish movement has just launched uh, a new campaign for f uh, demanding freedom of Ojalan, right? the Kurdish freedom movement's um, ideological, political leader, uh, because they recognize that uh, he is the crucial figure who can make the resumption of peace talks happen. And uh, people can check out our website to get more information on that. If I could also just quickly add for listeners who are in the United States. Um, so as all of this is going on, uh, President Biden is urging Congress to sell an entire fleet of brand new American-made F-16 fighter jets to Turkey. 
uh, along with modernization kits to basically update the F-16s that they already have acquired, uh, which they're currently using along with drones to attack civilians in Northeast Syria. This sale of F-16s has to have congressional approval. The president can't just single-handedly force it through. And the responsibility for that is on the, like the ultimate authority, in other words, is on the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. That was Bob Menendez. He's had a whole scandal. He's, he's out of his position. So now there's a new chair. His name is Ben Cardin, Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. Um, and so another thing that we're doing, in fact, when we get off the recording of this, uh, of this podcast, we're going to go to a phone bank that we're organizing to, to really put direct pressure on him to do the right thing and block this sale. He's expressed tentative opposition to it, but kind of wavered a little bit saying things like, well, I'm going to have to see the details and I'll, I'll speak more with the administration about this. But this is a concrete way that the United States could st- stop enabling Turkey's crimes. And, and, and it should go without saying that everything that Turkey does in Northeast Syria, or anyway, where is with United States support, with NATO support, military and political support, you know, these planes, again, that they're using, um, as well as some of the parts in the Turkish drones even, come from the United States. So those of us who are here, I think we have responsibility to do everything that we can to make sure that, you know, our tax dollars, so to speak, are not going to fund and enable these war crimes. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. You will never, ever surrender or compromise! We occupied government buildings, we blockaded highways, and we talked about not just marching, but direct action to shut this shit down! Yate, we invite you to join us for Indigenous Action, a podcast where we dig deep into critical issues impacting our communities in the occupied lands known as the so-called United States or what many people recognize as Turtle Island. This is an autonomous, anti-colonial broadcast with unapologetic and claws-out analysis towards total liberation. So take your seat by this fire and may the bridges we burn together light our way. Find us at indigenousaction.org and with the Channel Zero Network. Yeah, and an interesting thing I hadn't been aware of, and I wonder if you could enlighten me and the audience a little bit about, was the recent visit to Rojava by a U.S. delegation um, in late August, which appears to be quite a shift from the chilling of the U.S., since the Trump administration, but also maybe points to differentiation within the the U.S. administration between different departments or just between different politicians. I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit about if that gives any hope to also like a possible leverage point for undermining further arms sale to Turkey. I think just contextually, one thing is that if people are following the situation more closely, they might remember that Trump made an announcement that we would pull all of our troops out of Syria in 2019. And then that led directly two days later to a Turkish invasion of Northeast Syria. However, that didn't happen. <laughs> as as with many things, it was kind of all talk, right? So actually, U.S. troops never, I think maybe there were a few troop withdrawals, but it, there's been continuous U.S. presence since then. We have, we have never pulled out of Syria. And so I think in the military level, it was sort of a, a management game of uh, sort of perception. So, you know, and the perception level, it gave Turkey the green light to invade. But the reality is that we were still physically there and we are still physically there as a military. And so uh, there's that one is that that relationship has never been broken. And that was just sort of one of those weird things <laughs> that happened during the Trump administration, which is like where what he was saying wasn't reflecting reality. Um, and everybody had to kind of scramble in the background. And then the other thing is, I, I believe that that visit was primarily to Al Hol camp. And so Al Hol camp is a, it's a refugee camp in the autonomous administration territory. There's about, uh, give or take 50,000 people who still live there. 
The vast majority of them are family members, children, wives of ISIS fighters. It's a difficult situation. There's also some people who were fleeing ISIS living there with them, unfortunately. And that is a very difficult place. And it's a really difficult powder keg situation for the entire region and for the world. Um, and the autonomous administration has been left to deal with it pretty much by themselves. There are about eight to 10,000 former uh, internationals living there. And the autonomous administration is sort of doing a lot of diplomacy to try to get them repatriated to their home countries. But of course, that's a security question for the for the home countries as well. So, so many people who came internationally to support Daesh or to support the... Um, yes, like, okay. exactly. So Russians, French, Moroccans, Australians, right? Americans. Yeah, specifically. So that place is a very difficult place. There are often raids throughout the camp. There are attacks. You, you now have you know, young young boys who've been living essentially in this big cage for a long time, <laughs> for their coming of age time, and receiving, they have, it's called the Cubs of the Caliphate. You know, Daesh has a sort of training of young young boys, how they, how they uh, do that. And the international section of the camp is so dangerous that UNICEF doesn't offer their normal educational services within that area. And so, a lot of the education has been left to the community <laughs> um, and the community within Al Hol is, is connected to Daesh. So it's a very difficult situation. The longer it sort of people are allowed to fester there, the more you get younger, younger boys. And of course, younger, younger women as well. Of course, the women themselves who are radicalized more and more uh, again. And so that's very difficult. ISIS is still an insurgency. Yeah. There's prisons in general in Northeast Syria have about 10,000 ISIS fighters within them. And something needs to be done about that. They need a lot of support from the international community. Support is not forthcoming. It's very difficult with evidence to try to start a trial system, although they're, they have efforts to do that. And so just say the relationship that the U.S. has with Northeast Syria is militarily is, you know, quote unquote, predicated on the, the continued defeat of the ISIS insurgency. As you can tell from what I've just said, that continues to be a big problem. About two years ago, there was a big attack on this, these, one of the largest prisons holding ISIS fighters. They, their plan was to break out the fighters and then go to Al Hol, this big camp, to break them out. And then, you know, if the opportunity presented itself to reestablish territorial control. So it's an active threat. Um, and the U.S., is there militarily because of that, quote unquote. And then also there are other chess pieces, of course, with Iran, et cetera. What the autonomous administration calls for is one, more military support in the sense of a no-fly zone for Turkey to not be able to bomb. <laughs> so if we're going to be there militarily, why don't we might as well, <laughs> you know, actually support in a way that would be helpful to the project on the ground, and then also for political support as well. So it's nice that they're there militarily, but what about, you know, uh, recognition for the autonomous administration? What about statements saying that they support the sort of incredible democratic gender equal project that is being built on the ground that all the SDF fighters are giving their lives to, to support? So that's what I would say about that. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Arthur. I would just add that kind of in broad strokes, the way we can see it is that the United States relationship to the administration or to the movement in Russia is a military is a military one. It's not a political one. And so and even within the military support, it's very divided, right? This 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 support is only to cooperate on operations against ISIS. Right. So so if Rojava is being invaded by Turkey, the United States, of course, is not going to play any any role in that. So what's going on is, is that while the region has received and continues to receive military support for operations against ISIS, it has yet to receive even formal political recognition as a legitimate government, right? So the, the Thomas administration has never been recognized as the United States as a legitimate governing body, nor has it been recognized by any other uh, government in the world. I think technically like the autonomous region of Catalonia, their parliament uh, issued recognition a couple years ago, but that's it. So that's something that we've been pushing for is is formal recognition of the Thomas administration, and that would help with a whole lot of other things as far as getting aid to them, as far as giving them a 
diplomatic seat at the table when it comes to the overall negotiations to end the Syrian conflict. Um, but that is yet to happen. Um, so we continue to, to push for that. And I, to be clear, I, I don't see, I don't, I don't think the movement sees either like the recent delegation as any significant change of heart. It, I think it's more or less consistent with at least what the policy has been since uh, the Biden administration came into power. Yeah, someone had used the term proxy earlier to describe some of the activities of the Barzani-led Peshmerga forces in Iraq. And I wonder if you all could maybe expand a little bit on how you see the military and political operations happening in Iraq affecting life and politics inside of Syria as the KRG continues to conflict with the, you know, SDF and with the KCK affiliated forces? Well, I already talked about the embargo um, that the KRG has been imposing, uh, which, you know, I believe that it does so because of its collaboration with Turkey. Um, I don't know, Arthur, would you add anything else? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's tough. It's another big topic. No, I think the most direct influence on Rojava is, yes, is through through the embargo, through their control of the border, through their their control of, of what kind of uh, aid or other economic um, you know products make it into northeast Syria. But um, for those who aren't familiar, right, the the PKK, its guerrilla forces are based in the mountains of northern Iraq, and Turkey increasingly occupies parts of northern Iraq. Has built a whole series of military bases. And the Kurdistan regional government and the KDP, which is kind of hegemonic within that government, has been collaborating directly with Turkish forces in operations against the PKK. Um, and so at the very least, I think we could see on a military level that that absolutely inflames the overall relations between what we call the Kurdish Freedom Movement, which is like all of the revolutionary Kurdish organizations that follow the lineage from the PKK to follow the ideology of Abdullah Ocalan, even though there are like organizational distinctions, which are very important to understand. Nonetheless, you know, when the KDP goes after, when the KDP Peshmerga attacks PKK in Northern Iraq, for example, or collaborates with Turkish attacks, the people in Syria, they also, they, they see that as an attack on them too, because of this larger identity that they have. They see it as an attack on their movement, which it is. So in, in a larger sense, beyond just the economic embargo and the enforcement of what crosses the border, there's, there's a real risk of like Kurdish on Kurdish military conflict, which the, the movement, everybody I talk to, they see that as something that would be terrible, that when it does happen, it, it's, it's tragic. The, the KDP also has proxy forces, you could say, or parties that are aligned with it within northern Syria, and that plays out in different in different ways. It's kind of the main political opposition within Northeast Syria, political opposition to uh, the administration within the Kurdish community is in a party called ENKS, which is basically the Syrian equivalent of uh, the Barzani-led factions of the KDP in, in Northern Iraq. But it's really like, it's such a can of worms conversation. There's a lot, there's, there's links everywhere. They're military, they're economic, they're political. Great, thank you. So August of 2023 saw the beginning, as I mentioned before, of large demonstrations emanating through and from southern Syria against the continued dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad's Ba'athist party. Have you heard about this? And is there solidarity being shown from within Rojava and also from the autonomous administration? Yes. So we already talked about the just dire economic conditions, all, not just in northeast Syria, but all across Syria and uh, these worsening living conditions uh, what, what was what triggered the um, sort of wave of uh, protests um, in August uh, earlier this year, specifically in Suweda, South Syria, Dara, and even um, some towns uh, in the Damascus countryside. So it was triggered by the Assad's government sort of lifting of subsidies on heating fuel and gas, which has more than doubled the prices on that on those uh, basic necessities. Uh, but uh, really, the protests were uh, more than just about uh, the 
economic situation and sort of the slogans and the demands that uh, people put forward, you know, you can say it represented a continuity, right, with the initial demands and initial inspirations of the 2011 um, so-called Arab Spring in Syria, right? So people were chanting down with Assad, which indicates a political component, right, uh, against the Assad's um, government's um, authoritarian um, policies and against uh, the ongoing human rights violations uh, in regime-held areas. And so that was kind of quite hopeful. And uh, there was a lot of solidarity pouring out from the autonomous administration. At least we from here uh, were seeing uh, many solidarity statements by different structures. For example, um, the women's movement in northeast Syria sort of published um, their, expressed their support with the women uh, participating in those protests um, in the regime held areas um, and sort of their demands for gender equality. And uh, overall, the autonomous administration has seen its project as a, hopefully as a solution for the entire country, for the um, uh, post-civil war future of the entire Syria. So for years now, they have been reaching out quite systematically, quite intentionally to other opposition actors within Syria, right? Um, and particularly those who are not affiliated uh, with the Turkish-backed Syrian National Council, which is like the Syrian opposition in exile, uh, with whom the Kurdish movement at the outset very early on had uh, a fallout because of the opposition's um, sort of Arab nationalist um, attitudes towards the Kurds. But in any case, uh, the movement, the autonomous administration wants uh, or envisions uh, some sort of decentralized, democratized Syria as um, this country's post-civil war um, future. And um, this is something they have been discussing with other um, actors opposed to the Syrian government in the rest of Syria. And uh, that's why they welcomed this protest in the south of uh, Syria earlier this year. Three major goals of the Rojava revolution are the abolition of patriarchy, the creation of an ecologically sustainable and anti-capitalist society. The 12 years of this project's public existence has been obviously in the midst of a bloody and terrible civil war in Syria, as well as continued political and military intervention from nation states locally, like Turkey, and internationally. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how the ecological dimension of the Rojava revolution has been able to develop or not during this time, and if there's any specific restoration or remarkable projects that you'd want to highlight for the audience. Right, so ecology. Well, um, if you talk to the people in the region who are involved with the various ecological initiatives, they'll tell you up front, like, this is one of the aspects of the revolution that has been least developed. So they're quite honest that uh, they're lagging behind on this front. Though, of course, you know, other aspects of the revolution, as I hope we'll discuss a little bit later, haven't been developed you know, as much as the movement wants uh, to see them developed. But in any case, there are some hopeful projects uh, taking place. Um, and I'll talk more about the challenges later. Uh, for example, I visited uh, the very first recycling facility in Hasake. Uh, that is being run by a couple of communes and uh, with some support and funding from an Italian NGO. And it's basically just the movement trying to, the autonomous administration, to attempt to just even plant this idea that <laughs> once uh, garbage, once trash should be recycled. This is something very new to the people of the region. Uh, there is a very... Uh, little care, unfortunately, at this point for ecology, for environment among the regular folks. And that's quite understandable. You know, people who work with ecological initiatives, they say, we understand that people have other priorities. Like when we try to talk to them about the recycling their trash, they tell us, well, you know, when we get enough electricity per day, when we get our water, then come and talk to us about trash. But at the same time, the movement has been trying, so this recycling project uh, that they launched as a pilot project um, has 
turn out to be you know rather successful so they are hoping to get in to get more communes involved in this initiative and hopefully open more such facilities um, you know in other localities there have been a lot of tree planting campaigns from early on and you know I should probably note here that it's not because you know it's kind of sad to 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 acknowledge that like the biggest advance on the ecological front that the autonomous administration has done you know, were these tree planting campaigns, but the movement itself, kind of the people working on ecology acknowledge that this is not because they believe, or if we plant, just, just plant more trees, um, you know, we'll uh, solve our climate change problem. It's because, again, they're trying to grow this consciousness among regular people about right, the necessity to change our relationship to the environment. So that's sort of, they've been, they've seen that as an entry point kind of to develop that consciousness, but also because of the history of this region, the Syrian government has been, you know, was using it sort of as a weed bas basket, right? It's a kind of monoculture region and uh, even planting some fruit trees was prohibited uh, to the local people. But more about challenges, really, because if we want to talk about um, the ecology and learning from the revolution here, we can learn more not from the successes, but really from the obstacles that they have been dealing with. And so, you know, the big elephant in the room is oil, right? The region has to depend on its oil reserves, um, you know, to from which it gets most of its revenues, including to maintain um, the armed forces, given the ongoing you know, war conditions. And if you talk to the movement, right, they all recognize, I mean, at least the people who work, work uh, with the ecological initiatives, they recognize that this is in contradiction to the movement's uh, philosophy that's, that draws on the um, idea of social ecology developed by Mary Bookchin, as I'm sure everyone listening knows. So they know that's in contradiction, uh, clear violation, but this is just what they have to do at the moment. There is no other major revenue source available to the autonomous administration under these conditions. Of course, they have a lot of sun, so solar energy could be a viable alternative, but here again, uh, the same obstacles that I've discussed for other contexts, uh, they're just, they want to build a solar panels factory, but they're not able to because of partially this embargo that has been imposed on them. They're just not able to import uh, the necessary uh, equipment that would be needed for for such an enterprise. Uh, or if, and if they can import what they need, they would have to pay way more than they would um, do otherwise, again, because of uh, the KDP's control of the only border crossing. And of course, funding, right? Especially talking about this right after this latest military operation that wiped out so much of Northeast Syria's civilian infrastructure. I mean, let's just think where are they going to get funding to just even repair that, uh, let alone thinking how they can transition from oil to some sort of green energy. And so really like what I think we should be all thinking is, uh, can these countries in the global south in war zones, can they realistically, right, even start considering uh, some sort of transition and sort of deeper restructuring of their economies along ecological principles, uh, just given the circumstances that they have to deal with? And what would the role of the international solidarity movement be um, right on this particular front, right? So this, um, for example, the recycling facilities that I mentioned, that project has been funded by an Italian kind of sympathetic um, NGO. And that's why they have been able to do that. But uh, there's just so many things that are not able to carry out because uh, of all the obstacles I mentioned. So again, what can we expect from them realistically and um, how can we help them achieve those goals? That's something we should be thinking about. I don't mean to keep like just bringing up points which the 
like goals, stated goals of the Rojava revolution haven't reached their point. But if we recognize that like, revolutions are a constant process and no one's perfect, then it's like, I'm not meaning any insult to the to the project and the work that people have put in. It's just cool to to hear about where people are working on improvement. And as as um, Anya stated, another element that we haven't really spoken about much in terms of the Rojava Revolution has been the anti capitalist element. Um, wondering if you could talk a little bit about the application of communal or cooperative modes for production, if there is private property being held inside Rojava, if there's been any like large redistributions of concentrated property holdings, and how the population's expressed feeling or dis- made decisions around this sort of question of private versus communal versus administrative ownership of property. I'd be happy to take a crack at that. Yeah, so... A lot of people may know already the Kurdish freedom movement underwent like a major ideological transformation in the early 2000s, which was part of a reflection in some ways on the history of what they call, you know, quote unquote, real socialism of the Soviet Union, and also a reflection, kind of self-critical reflection on, on the, the movement's own kind of experience. And the part that people know most about is like the transformation of this idea of an approach to the state, right? Instead of seeking an independent Kurdish state, the movement now seeks democratic autonomy. But the economic side of things is is usually talked about far less than any of these other topics. And I'm really glad you brought it up because it's so important. And I think a lot of people don't realize that the the movement never lost its, it did not reject socialism. It has basically transformed its idea of, of what socialism means. And, and at its core, it is this like communalization of, of power. And, and that's this idea of democratic confederalism. But the philosophy that, that the movement bases its ideas on economically is this concept of social economy or like society economy, like Aburiya um, Jivak in Kurdish. And at its core, I, th- I think it's it, people can understand it as as more or less classic, you know, communalist communist economics um, in the sense that it emphasizes use value and and rejects capitalism. But just like many other theories, like aspects of the revolution, right? Like the theory and the practice are sometimes divergent. Or another way to put it is that the movement hasn't accomplished all of its goals quite yet. And I think much like the previous conversation about ecology, the aspect of building the social economy has also been one of the least developed aspects of of the revolution. That said, it's still a part of the, the, the life and structure of the movement on a daily basis. There's a few different ways that they're trying to transform the economy. First of all, when it comes to land holdings before the revolution, um, as soon as the movement declared autonomy in its, in its own territory, it expropriated all the property that was formerly held by the regime. And it placed that property into the hands of what's now called the autonomous administration and or uh, directly into the hands of local communes and cooperatives to manage themselves. And so one of the advantages in that case, for those of us who would like to see one or another form of like socialist transformation of the economy, is that previously, because of the nature of the Ba'ath regime, of the Assad regime, the state owned staggering amounts of property. Um, and so there, there were large expropriations, but there are expropriations of the state. However, there have not been many expropriations of private property. I've heard of some which have come as a result of People who own, say, like large land holdings or apartment buildings or something uh, being found through like the justice system guilty of various crimes or whatever and and had their property like given to the community. But that's actually pretty rare as far as I understand. Um, And in fact, like some people may know, um, one of the kind of contradictions you could say of the revolution is that private property is, is technically protected under the social contract um, of the, of the region. But I think we need to see that as as something kind of pragmatic in the sense that the people who want to see socialist transformation of the economy are by far a minority in the region. They 
they definitely were definitely were before the revolution and they and they still are today so the movement is kind of taking a long term approach to this part of it is is just trying to raise people's consciousness in the first place about what they call capitalist modernity and the need to transform society into what they call democratic modernity which includes the social economy but in practical terms there's a few different ways this plays out one is the creation of cooperatives and that's probably the primary driver of the transformation of the economy so rather than taking exist- existing private property and creating cooperatives out of it for the most part these cooperatives are being uh constructed as as new economic entities many of them out of property that was formerly in the hands of the regime so for example land being turned into cooperative farms that used to be held by the state talking about the cooperatives real quick it's important to emphasize that the movement just like in all other aspects emphasizes women's autonomy right so even within the economy there's a whole adjacent committee called women's economy and what it's focusing on is uh prioritizing women especially like poor working class women uh women with households that don't have an income um widows of of martyrs and bringing them together to form cooperatives giving them land or whatever material means they need to create cooperative enterprises to sort of like maintain uh economic independence and to again try to build the building blocks of the social economy but i think it's important to say that overall these kind of worker cooperatives are still a very marginal portion of the overall economy for the most part it's 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 a mixed certainly a mixed economy but but is very much a market economy in a generalized sense with a large public sector related to the administration uh, but besides the cooperatives there's also a union movement which is now under the purview of an organization called Tevdem whose role has kind of changed over the years but Tevdem stands for uh in Kurdish stands for the movement for a democratic society and so they organize associations of all different kinds of workers so like laborers um even things like small uh shopkeepers people who work for the administration there's a teachers union um and there's efforts to expand unionization to basically organize all workers in society and they see that as a part of kind of building democratic confederalism as a as a fundamental part of that so there's been real limitations to on the one hand to building um the social economy of the future that the movement dreams of just like a post capitalist economy and a lot of those constraints have been external right so on you mentioned the embargo of course even just like the instability of the constant attacks the lack of capital and a and a reliable revenue stream for the administration itself to be able to like seed alternative economic projects has also been very limited but I also think it's worth mentioning that there's some of the limitations are internal in the sense that the movement is still kind of navigating what it means to build an economics of democratic confederalism in my opinion i think it's still kind of in the developing stages the structures of governance in the sense of the communes and the cooperatives Uh, excuse me the communes and the councils that are federated from the local up to the regional those are very well developed conceptually practically but when it comes to the economy there's still a lot of debate about how do we, like not just what is a social economy but how are we really going to get there um and i heard people with a lot of different ideas about what that meant and disagreements about you know the limitations of cooperatives and how to make decisions about what to do with private property and how to hold those who hold private property accountable but lastly it's just really important for people to keep in mind that th- the external constraints are real and even just to put it uh concretely in terms of like there's there's a small handful of capitalists <laughs> who control much of the trade to and from the KRG right in northern iraq and Rojava is nowhere near a place where they can meet all of their needs by producing everything that the society consumes or needs to consume right so they rely heavily on on import but what that also means is that they rely on the small handful of pre-existing companies that have those relationships with the KRG that can move things in and out of the region i feel that we've spent a lot of time talking about all the the difficulties that the revolution faces and there are very many the women's movement 
It's a huge spark of light because the basis of the, the movement is women's liberation. And so the fact that that is going well, and I will explain how it's going well um, very briefly, is a, a real cause for hope and a real cause for excitement, especially, as we know, in a place where ISIS continues to knock on the door. So it's a, it's a pretty wild juxtaposition, and it's pretty amazing and awe-inspiring if you just take a second to stop and think about it. So in broad strokes, the women's movement and what, what women's liberation and gender equality means in Rojava uh, is incredibly progressive. It basically means full women's autonomy, um, both in the military uh, realm of society and in the civil realm of the society. So within the military forces, um, women are in autonomous units and in no place do they take orders or commands from a man. They can cooperate, of course, when necessary, right? Your female commander can tell you for the next week, please listen to this male commander, right? But they have a genuinely autonomous system, which has incredible ripple effects into the society at large. They also have an autonomous women's police force and local com uh, community defense units. Um, they teach each other how to use the weapons. They have all of the, the technical know-how that they need amongst themselves, um, and they are truly autonomous. And that has ripple effects into the society at large, um, makes a big difference. If you kind of know you really can't bully these people around, right? It's, it's, it's a subtle thing and it's also a not so subtle thing. Um, and so in the society, there's also uh, autonomous women's organizing structures that comes from the root at, from Congress Star, which is sort of a, the, the greater body of women's organizing. It's in every sort of village or city, there'll be a Congress Star office, the point of which a woman can go there, make a point of contact with the society if she wants to get politically involved, if she needs help with something. The Mala Jin, the women's restorative justice system, started out of the Congress Star organizing structure. Um, and so that is a, is a very positive thing. Um, so yeah, there's autonomous women's organizing on the uh, civil side and on the military side. And what that has uh, sort of grown into is a, is a bunch of different, different structures, including a women's justice council, which um, comes up with laws that affect women and family structures with input, of course, from across the society. And so in addition to the self-defense units, the justice system, the legislation, uh, the legislative bodies in general in Rojava, so from the communes up to the, um, the, ladder, the levels that ladder up to the, the higher autonomous administration legislation, there's a 50% gender quota in the legislative bodies. And there is also a co-chair system meaning at every level from the communes all the way up to the top of the Taunus administration and within the unions that Arthur was just talking about that are forming, within the Justice Council, um, in all the structures that are connected to the autonomous administration, within Tevdem, there is the co-chair system, which is a man and a woman together making decisions and sitting in the executive seat. People have a lot of questions about that. It's very interesting. It's a new way of relating between men and women, and it's a, it's a fascinating sort of sociological experiment. I went around and took portraits of 70 pairs of co-chairs, and they have all different sort of stories about how they work it out, how they make decisions together, what their process is, how long it took them to sort of get comfortable with that. But in general, they all sort of agree this really gives us strength, right? We it's helpful to have not just one person in charge um, and also to have different perspectives. So it's a very interesting, very unique system. There are other things uh, on the ground, like there's an all-female village called Jinwar, um, where a lot of women who experience domestic violence often um, can go and live with their children. There is also the Women's Political Education Academies, mostly connected to genealogy, like I was talking about a little bit before. And then just to mention that it's not just uh, Kurdish women, the Syriac women have their own autonomous organizing. So Syriac being the Christian, the indigenous Christian population, they have their own organizing, uh, Syriac women's union organizing body. And that was also founded sort of even before the revolution, starting in 2005 in the late nineties, you know, they have been also doing this organizing right um, on the ground. And so to keep in mind that it's, it's never just 
one thing, right? It's always the confluence of different uh, revolutionary timelines, different organizing struggles coming together um, and being in a mix and working together. And that's really the spirit of the autonomous administration is, is bringing together all of the, the people's histories of the, the peoples of this place, this multi-ethnic area, um, and building that into a sustainable and harmonious system. And then uh, in the majority Arab areas, which were um, taken over from ISIS, the, the Arab women also realize they have slightly different needs. They have slightly different cultural realities. And so they also, um, about a year and a half ago, founded their own um, assembly, which is a sort of Congress star equivalent called the Zenobia Assembly, which is a, an old famous queen um, from, from Palmyra in Syria. So there's a lot of stuff going on all the time. Women have uh, opportunities to get involved um, with political organizing. Um, they have opportunities to receive help from the uh, autonomous administration in the, in the justice system. There's a whole new women's law, which gives them many more rights than under the Syrian regime. And they can also join a militia should they want to, to choose a, a slightly different life for themselves. That's not to say there aren't huge obstacles culturally, logistically, everything for, for a woman uh, who's trying to build a life for herself, right? It's still a, a culture very much rooted in family values and family structure, um, which can be a very positive for thing for some people and can be incredibly restrictive for other people. Um, so it's complicated, it's moving, it's shifting, but there are real structures with a real proven track record of, of success and slowly shifting the needle on gender equality within the society that exist and are functioning. Uh, and it's a pretty amazing story considering ISIS knocks on the door every day of what they're trying to do. So yeah, it's great. A real, real reason for hope in the world at large, not just in Rojava, I feel. Yeah, that's amazing. And thank you for touching on that. And obviously there's a lot more that could be said about that, that uh, we sadly don't have time to do here. But I wonder, um, just in closing, you can send me a list of resources and then I'll tack those on into the show notes for folks to learn more, as well as projects that you think are pretty great. But if you could reiterate just what the ways that people abroad, particularly in the so-called U.S., can do to take some of the pressure off of the Rojava revolution and the people living in the autonomous administration, that would be super helpful. Sure, yeah. Because I don't know exactly when this episode is going to air, I want to say first that the best thing people can do is to get in touch with ECR by going to defendrojava.org. You can also email info at defendrojava.org. And pretty much on any of the social media platforms, you can find us at Defend Rojava. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we, we don't just give updates on the situation on the ground, what's happening in Northeast Syria, but... We try to regularly organize advocacy campaigns. And part of that, even though it's not always kind of the sexiest work uh, for revolutionaries, um, but it's important work nonetheless, is, is that we, we bang on the doors, literally figuratively, of uh, elected officials, especially members of Congress, to try to push them on this issue. And sometimes that means pushing them on very specific issues at very specific times, but in ways that could could make a significant material impact on, on the movement there. So as was mentioned earlier, this issue of the proposed sale of F-16 fighter jets to Turkey while they're leveling infrastructure in northeast Syria and killing civilians could not be more urgent and also could not be more timely. It's a great opportunity for us to try to pressure, especially Senator Ben Cardin, uh, on this issue to commit to blocking that sale. But more generally, we try to put pressure on all elected officials across the board to speak out publicly and forcefully on this issue, but also to put forth uh, possible legislation that could secure different kinds of aid. Um, we call on them to push for political recognition uh, of the autonomous administration and a whole host of different issues. So the best way is just to get in touch, become our comrade and work on it with us together. And if people who are listening, if you are part of any leftist progressive group, network, etc., help us build bridges. That's one 
something that we have been trying to do more and more, like build bridges between organizers here in the United States and directly with organizers there on the ground in Northeast Syria. If people go to our website, our YouTube page, you'll see some of the meetings that we have had so far uh, with the unions, uh, with cooperatives, you know, on both sides of the world. And we want to do more. We want to connect people, uh, like build this organic solidarity relationships so that both sides can learn from each other and support each other. Great. Thank you so much, all three of you, for participating in this conversation and for bringing the knowledge and experience that you have and for the work that you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting us on. Thanks. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay, or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf support. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. We are witnesses to genocide. As you listen to this, a systematic ethnic cleansing is taking place. The elimination of a people wiping them from the face of the earth. And if you're in the United States, this genocide is being carried out with your money and with your government's implicit consent. Food, water, and electricity have been cut off for the populations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip as military forces build up to launch a ground and air assault against a largely unarmed civilian population. The origins of this dire situation are not rocket attacks last Saturday. The origins of this situation could be traced back to 1945 with something called the Balfour Agreements, when the government of Great Britain authorized European Jews to return to an area of the Middle East and resettle the nation-state of Israel. Of course, this is something of a half-truth. Largely, the people returning to the Middle East were not returning at all. They were converts to Judaism, not descendants of Middle Eastern people. So, accurately, they were returning to the Middle East as much as I can return to Cambodia. Under a flag of Zionism, Jewish transplants began to occupy the area of Palestine, displacing the existing population. With assistance in arms from Western powers, who, with quiet cynicism and anti-Semitism of their own, encourage Jewish flight from their own countries, the modern nation-state of Israel came into existence. In the process, the existing Palestinian population was herded into open-air concentration camps on the West Bank and Gaza Strip, kicked out of their own homes and their own communities. Over the course of decades, there have been a systematic effort. Now, over the course of decades, there's been a systematic effort to eliminate the Palestinian people and a kind of covert apartheid. Historically, until just recently, they've been prohibited from forming their own system of governance. They have been afforded half the water rations provided to Israeli Jews, and they are often refused services at Israeli hospitals and places of business, subjected to an apartheid as complete as that imposed on the non-white population in South Africa. Accompanying the systematic elimination of the Palestinian people, the Israeli government has permitted the annexation of remaining Palestinian lands in the West Bank, often bulldozing the homes of Palestinians to make space for Israeli Jews to settle. The rest of the world is appalled by all of this, understandably so, but sanctions are consistently vetoed by the United States and the UN Security Council, where the US has a permanent seat. As a consequence, Israel, a top five human rights abuser, gets a free pass. While slow roasted genocide continues, there are periodic peace efforts that go nowhere. Time is on Israel's side, so they continue to bargain in bad faith. In the 1990s, the only sticking point to a decidedly unfair peace agreement 
that the Palestinians were otherwise willing to accept was Israel's insistence on maintaining control over the water supply to Palestinian territories. And somehow the Palestinians were made to be the bad guys. Could you imagine any peace agreement where one side would cede control of their water supply to an adversary with a long history of trying to exterminate them? Much is also made of Palestinian groups asserting that the nation state of Israel has no right to exist. This statement is often equated with saying that the Jewish people have no right to exist, which is not what's being said. I think it's a historical fact that the origins of the Israeli state are illegitimate, a product of illegal invasion and conquest. Israel's apologists often claim that if that's the standard, then Israel is only as illegitimate as the United States, which was also founded upon conquest. I'm cool with that. The U.S. has no right to exist either. And that probably goes a long way to explain the tight friendship between the two countries, as they're both somewhat sociopathic. Despite the rhetoric, however, Palestinians have sought a two-state solution. They simply want their own state through which to normalize relations. Historically, the U.S. and Israel have opposed this, opposing a Palestinian state's right to exist. The first time a U.S. president advocated a two-state solution was on September 12, 2001, less than 24 hours after al-Qaeda smacked planes into buildings. It's instructive, but Palestinian nonviolence fell on deaf ears, while violence got its wishes granted. Recognition of a two-state solution didn't last long, however. Israel and the U.S. entertained it so long as the Palestinian people supported the Palestinian Liberation Organization. But as soon as Palestinians voted in Hamas as their leadership, all bets were off. So much for respecting democracy. Most recently, Benjamin Netanyahu has led the Likud party and the Israeli government to an extreme swing to the right, bringing in Jewish supremacists who openly advocate for the liquidation of the Palestinian people. And in a wag-the-dog scenario, they've taken a hard-line approach to Palestine in the face of numerous corruption investigations. It is in this context that Hamas has responded in desperation and violence last Saturday, launching rockets and attacks into Israel. This, it appears, only reinforces the narrative of Hamas being a terrorist organization and sets the stage for Israel to punish the Palestinian people possibly erasing them entirely. But we're not powerless to stop this. The U.S. provides $3.8 billion a year to Israel in military aid. That's a lot of tanks and bombs and attack helicopters. All of those things are manufactured somewhere, and we let that happen. They're transported to Israel, and we let that happen too. We can stop genocide. I recall that a group of college kids wanted to stop the U.S. prosecution of an illegal war in Vietnam. As the weather underground, they took credit for 5,000 domestic bombings in an 18-month period in the United States, targeting government facilities, war research, and military contractors. This, more than anything, led to the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. This contributed, along with many other factors, to the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. We are witnesses to genocide. As you listen to this, a systematic ethnic cleansing is taking place. The elimination of a people, wiping them from the face of the earth. And if you're in the United States, this genocide is being carried out with your money and with your government's implicit consent. But, as the Weather Underground showed us a generation ago, we can stop it. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A24. 3205 OSP Youngstown 
878 Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown, Ohio 44505. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. 